I've closed the doors, so now you're trapped. I've had my husband sitting here staring at me going, don't swear, don't swear. So I will do my very best not to swear. However, what is this about? It's not what you think uh, at all. But work with me, just bear with me, come with me, we'll see where this goes. If you find yourself reacting extremely emotionally to anything I say, that's totally fine, I get it, but ask yourself why. Can you put into words why anything I happen to say makes you angry? If you can, awesome, let's talk. If you find yourself reacting very emotionally to anything I have to say and you want to be like, put it into words as well. Okay, so, who am I? Um, I'm Hanley. I'm from Wits University, from the Department of Digital Arts. Okay, so is that like programming or graphic design? Neither, both, sort of. Uh, our students come from two different degrees, two different faculties. We take people from information engineering, uh, doing a Bachelor of Engineering, and people from the School of Arts, doing a Bachelor in Arts, and we have them in the same classes, and it gets wonderfully confusing and a lot of fun. Uh, personally, I teach game design, and interactive media. Okay, so you come from design. No, actually, my background is in fine arts, uh, history of art, and English literature. It's not a bad thing to sometimes hear different voices. So this is me bringing a little bit of the humanities into the discussion here today. Yes. It is going to be academic, I'm sorry. Okay. What it says on the box, one of the things I realized attending the conference is that we look at the name and we look at the title, and we don't actually click through to see what it says on the box. So, programming languages are languages. Well, yes, it's in the name. When we code, we are making meaning. Uh, you're staying the obvious, so... You do have a bad feeling I'm going to overcomplicate it, because I am. Words have power. What you say and how you say it matters. We are still talking about programming languages. Software has far-reaching ramifications, but these often go unseen. Totally. That's why we do what we do. That's why we love working in tech. That's why we love software. To understand the socio-cultural impacts of the code we write, we need to think about the power of our words. This talk introduces critical code literacies and demonstrates how thinking about code this way could drive meaningful change. You're not sure what my point is, but meaningful change sounds like a good thing, right? Okay. So first up, what is code? Mm, you think you've got this down, right? But I come from an academic background, so I like definitions. So let's put it out there. The act of programming is expressing computational thinking through the syntax of programming languages. Code is the artifact of programming as an exercise. It's the textual, executable body of work that denotes computational thinking through the syntax of programming languages. We've got a definition. Okay, so what is critical? An academic. To work within a critical paradigm is to be concerned with the analysis and redressing of systems of power. The aim is not only to critique society, but also to provide the foundation to transform society as a whole. Don't panic. 
All this means at the end of the day is that to be critical is to be aware that everything we do is part of a system of power and to care about how that power impacts us all. Okay, look at this room. I hate lecture halls. I hate lecture halls because I set up a very specific power dynamic. I am here, whether you want to or not, you are now stuck listening to me, looking at me, focusing on me. I am, by virtue of my position as speaker, uh, probably the fact that I'm old, but by virtue of the way the room is laid out, there is a power dynamic here. And this exists in everything we do. Take a look at it as you move through the space. Shopping centers are amazing to analyze in terms of the power dynamics they create. Okay, now there are lots of different criticals and critical theories. So, what kind of critical am I talking about? Oh no, you didn't. Rhodes has nothing to do with this and apples fall down. Oh yes, I did. So work with me for a minute. This is not what I signed up for. Just relax, listen, work with me. Decolonialism is many, many things. By definition, it's about plurality. Okay? The one I am choosing to look at, the one angle that I'm going to use as my lens of approach, is how we think, how we know, and the assumptions that we make in our daily practice. So, what is two and two? Anybody, what is two and two? Four. Two plus two equals four. When written in this format, it is undeniable. There is no way that two plus two does not equal four. Okay? It is when we see it like this. Two squares and two squares is five squares. Okay, I'm going somewhere, I am going somewhere. It's not the same, you're changing the goalposts, you didn't say anything about squares. Exactly, it's not the same, okay? question sounds the same, but it meant something different, right? The context changed. The answer was dependent on the information you had at the time, okay? Having more information would have changed the way you approached it. If I had told you up front we were talking about squares, you wouldn't have thought of two plus two. Okay. Your way of thinking about the problem is different. Okay. Now, more academic. The way we think, the way we think about thinking, knowledge, our theories of knowledge, is your epistemology. Okay. Your epistemology informs the paradigm that you work within. The paradigm is the way you frame your questions. It is your thought patterns, the concepts and the theories that you consider to be legitimate, okay? Your paradigm informs the assumptions that you make, okay? And the assumptions you make changes how you approach the problem. When we approached this problem, there were two right answers because while we were asking the same question, that question had two different meanings. All right, nice trick question, but what does this have to do with roads? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Assumption 
informed by all of those ways of thinking, knowing, and doing, depends on who you are and how you have been taught to think. What paradigm you have been conditioned to accept as valid and right. And because of the systems of colonialism, because of the way we were taught in school, our default is almost always colonial. Okay. So, where am I going with this? Okay. The global knowledge economy has extended to include digital knowledge as a valid system. And this underlies techno-colonialism. Techno what? Access to the means of digital knowledge production is essential for reshaping the dynamics of cultural power. Okay? Digital knowledge production, embodied in programming and eventually our code, must therefore be deconstructed to surface the embedded epistemologies. But why? To make sure we're answering the same time to make sure we're answering the same questions. I didn't swear. Okay. Our ways of thinking, our default access into that moment, needs to be clarified, needs to be articulated, so that we can be sure we're answering the same question. Okay. So, moving on to get more raised eyebrows. There's something wrong with this picture. The software sector sucks. You can shoot me. I know you think you will. It is a white male mess. And I am old enough and white enough to have the privilege to say it out loud. Okay. It's often called out for exclusion, marginalization, and unethical technolo techno technologies and research practices. Okay. That can be seen in who is making and what is being made. Okay. I've put a quote in. I took, take, I took all, the only two quotes in this whole thing. I took all the others out, okay. and I took my references out. So I'm trying, right? I left this here because I thought it was hysterical. Stereotypes for programmers appear to have been baked into the profession early on. Enzima notes that personality profiling, I kid you not, this is a very real, very well documented thing, was used in the 60s to select for antisocial, mathematically inclined male programmers. It's no longer practiced explicitly but the stereotype continues, okay? And stereotypes hurt everyone. Stereotypes hurt how we see ourselves and also what people imagine they can do and imagine what they can be. And it's created a self-selecting employment system, okay? Guys, I know no one likes to hear this, but go look at the industry surveys. It's real. It's there. We can't deny it or avoid it. Okay. Why is this an issue? What is being made? When we consider what is being made, there is just so much writing on the dangers of technologies developed without the inputs of marginalized groups. It, you can't summarize it. So I've pulled out a, a hit list, okay? The gorillas. You all know about Google's gorillas? Who here has heard about Google's gorillas? Okay, a couple of you. So, <laughs> image recognition puts it out there, and it tags black people as gorillas. 
Go look it up. They rolled out a patch for it in 2018. Okay. It's kind of messed up, right? Facial recognition, Chicago Police Department, profiling for criminal traits. Simple things like forms that only accept surnames that are more than three characters and no special characters. I can see there is some nodding of people who have experienced this. Airport security that flags your genitals when it doesn't match the way you are presenting your gender. A beautiful article on it called Traveling Wind Trance that is a, a fascinating read. Okay. And Facebook should die. Okay. My point is when these two things are combined, it sucks. Okay. Marginalized people are not only not making, because they are underrepresented in the industry, they are also being disadvantaged by what is made. We're surrounded. We can't get out of it. There's a quote I took out, damn it, that says, the present ecosystem sustains itself by rewarding work that reinforces the conservative structure. Anything and anyone seen as challenging the status quo faces systemic re rejection and exclusion. And my point was, the technologies produced reflect the way of thinking of only a very homogenized group. But the power of these technologies impact the way of thinking and being across the globe. This is technological colonialism. Okay, and us. One of the big concerns I have is that we idealize the image of big tech, Silicon Valley. It sounds amazing, but we've just seen that a lot of it sucks. We build a lot of what we see our tech sector to be on being the silicon whatever it is today. Okay? But if we are uncritically adopting, trying to copy and paste from there, we face the possibilities of importing that cultural economic labor issues that we've now seen, right? South Africa is doing this in a massive way all of the time. If I have to hear my vice chancellor say the words for IR one more time, I, I think I might shoot him. I really won't, I, I promise. Um, I said what I said. Okay. Um, we are bringing in so many tech training initiatives. Okay. And every one of them is a copy and paste from an already problematic system. We need the skills. It's imperative for social justice that we have the skills to operate on a global stage. So what am I saying? I'm saying that's great, but we need to be critical. To be critical is to be concerned with systems of power. We need to think about what it is we are adopting and doing and bringing. Okay. So we need to be aware of systems of power in the ways of knowing, thinking, and doing in technology, software, programming, and our code. So why am I talking about literacies? I thought we were finally at the code. Almost, almost. I'm getting there. Okay. Is 
isn't literacy just being able to read and write? Okay, but read what? Write what? What do we mean by read? What do we mean by write? And this is why you hate the humanities. Uh, sorry. So I'll go back to my need to define. To be literate is to be able to participate in a way of meaning making that is shared between a group of people. Okay. There are two kinds of literacy for our purposes. Functional literacy. Functional literacy is the ability to read and write in a specific system of meaning making. Think of this text. To read it, you need to know the symbols, you need to know the language, you need to know the way in which the symbols connect to that language, how they represent in that language. Then you can make sense of it. To write it, you need to be able to form the symbols and then structure them in a way that others can read. You are making meaning. Then we have critical literacy. Critical literacy is the ability to situate that reading and writing in a cultural system. You do it already. Okay? You actually get taught to do it in those awful, awful, endless comprehension tests in school. Okay? Wasn't just there, you were taught. Examples, fake news, advertising. You come across a specific kind of text, it triggers something in you where you go, really? Okay, and you start thinking about it. You know that that deodorant is not going to turn you into a manly man. Okay? You understand what it is they're trying to say, and you interpret it. That is a critical literacy that you have, that you have been taught. Okay, so what about this text? There's a system of power happening here as well, and it's reinforced by the system of power in this room. Okay. You are not only reading the symbols and understanding them as words, you are also situating them within your own understanding. And how you approach it. Right from the beginning, when I was saying you might be approaching this with extreme skepticism. You might be looking at this and going, epistemoa, okay? You're interpreting, you're understanding, and you're situating it within what you know. Okay, so, code is illiteracy. To define it, we say that the act of programming is to engage with a semiotic system, a system of meaning making, to represent an executable computational function by deploying code signs. A signifier, the language and the syntax, and a signified, the procedures executed. So what? Okay, programming is making meaning, so using a, se a semiotic system to achieve a goal, an executable computational process, using a literacy of code signs. That literacy is made up of the language and syntax of a programming language and the procedure it executes. Right. Functional code literacy. When we're taught to program, it is often introduced as a clear set of instructions that you give a computer. It requires precise encoding within the parameters of specific rules set out by the programming language. Got it. This is functional code literacy. It's an alphabetized approach leading us to read and write code as unambiguous, utilitarian, and neutral. It presents code as removed from social systems since it is explicit and for a machine. Well, yeah, it is for a machine. Okay. But wait. The machine isn't the only thing that reads it. 
programming languages are higher level abstractions. The idioms are not machine instructions. They are converted from the programming language into machine instructions. Okay. Code may be functional, decoded and enacted by a computer. The complexity and expressiveness of programming languages and, and idioms exist for humans and are received and read socially. There's more. So our code signs are chosen both for what they tell the computer and what they tell the programmers. And these choices are social. Okay. They're made on the system requirements, the architecture, but also the social contracts and communal practices. Okay. Project standards, readability, what is considered good and bad in any given situation, elegant versus messy code. These things are context dependent, who you're working with, who's going to be interacting with it. Okay. Social decisions, but I'm not done yet. Okay. Hang on, there's definitely good and bad code, right? So cleaner, more precise code may perform more effectively, but at each level, decisions are being made based on which performance is being measured, what is important to the system, what constitutes valid behavior. Top down, right? But the code writes back. Okay. How, in every moment to moment, you choose to write that code is going to impact how the next person interacts with it. It's going to impact what the system does, how it can be built forward. Okay. So, we are making choices all of the time. And at all levels, these are human decisions that are made in a social framework and enacted in a semiotic system, a system of meaning making, therefore they are ideological. How on earth is this ideological, Hanley? Doesn't that imply we're doing things on purpose? No. Our ideology is based on the concepts, ideas, and ideals that are living rent-free in our heads. Okay? They are invisible. It is the system in which we operate all of the time. Okay? It is the assumptions we make when we answer the question. Okay? That two and two means two plus two and equals four. It's an assumption we made based on how we were taught to approach the problem, what it sounded like at the time. And it's a fair assumption. Okay? But each assumption is based on the decision maker's way of knowing and way of being in the world. Okay. It's not neutral. Back to our examples. When we get the gorillas, it's not intentional, but it's not neutral. It's the training data. Somewhat, but it's also so much more. It's the result of thousands upon thousands of tiny, invisible decisions that we make in every step of the process, going from the top down and from the code we write, writing back up. Eventually, cumulatively, these tiny decisions start reinforcing the dominant ideologies and upholding a status quo. Okay. No single snowflake is responsible for the avalanche. No single decision was responsible for the gorilla. Large systems of tiny moments. It's 
unintentional, but that doesn't make it neutral. Oh, come on, it's an outlier. It has nothing to do with technology, and the code is just the code. Decisions are based on what the system should do. And what should the system do? Who are the decision makers? What is the default way of knowing? What is being assumed? What is being replicated at every moment down that entire chain? A decision is being made, and that decision is based on the way of knowing, being, and doing in the world. So this is the back end of techno-colonialism, and it needs decolonizing. It's about our ways of knowing. I still don't see it. That's because it's almost invisible. It leaks into everything we do. It's part of what we know, part of how we know, part of how we assume the question. In day-to-day, development, the significance of the small moments are lost, because we think we're coding for a computer. So in those decisions you're going to make, it's completely lost. We only see the problem when it hits the fan and the gorillas appear. We don't see it in those tiny, small moments. This isn't applicable to me. I'm not building anything like this. Maybe not. And that's the problem with high-profile examples. Okay? We choose them because they have an observable effect in the world. Right? But that actually hides because it's an outlier. Because it's an outlier, it actually hides what's happening in the minute because it's easy to dismiss. We don't see the parallels that are happening in our own practice because they are small, invisible decisions. At the end of the day, our technology, our code, our software is really good at answering questions. And we are really bad at asking what questions should be answered. We hold on to this myth of neutrality. And the problem with it is that as long as we believe that what we do is neutral, we reinforce the status quo. I'm not allowed to say the words. So what am I supposed to do about it? I am who I am, and I can't be different, and it's too big, and it's out of my control. We are who we are. Our ways of knowing, being, and doing are part of who we are. They're not wrong, they're just one way. But there is something we can do about it. We can ask the questions about the questions. We need to learn to read our code. We need to learn to ask the questions about the questions. Am I answering the right question in this moment? What have I assumed? And we point our fingers upwards and say, it's the architecture. It's the requirements. Okay. We matter. Our code matters. Okay. Marino says that a person writing what is to them ordinary functional code is making meaning already. Critically reading code, that means reading and understanding your meaning making while thinking about the system of power in which it exists, does not depend on the discovery of hidden secrets and unexpected terms. Okay. We're not asking you to go out when you're building a, a, a website for a client and find a gorilla. Okay. We're asking to think about those moments, those decisions. It's not an easy transition to make. Okay? It requires not only the skill, which you have, but also the conceptual willingness to actually think about the fact that maybe these things aren't as neutral as they appear. Okay. It 
It's about the practice of situating that reading and writing is part of a system of power. So it's asking yourself every step of the way, what does this mean? Why am I doing it this way? What are the hidden effects? How does this fit into the larger system at play? Ain't nobody got time for that. You've got a deadline. Literacies are learned. When you first start acquiring a literacy, it takes time, and then you become fluent. And if we want, out of the suckage of the system, of answering the wrong questions, we need people to be fluent. We need to carry this kind of criticality into the sector. That's all very nice, Hanley, but what exactly am I doing? That's my last slide, because I want to know from you what exactly it is you think you're doing. Anyone have anything to say? There are a lot of raised eyebrows in this room. Nothing. Nobody. Nothing makes sense. In that case, we're done. Thank you for your time. <laughs>